Good to be your speaker this evening. Um, I've got some thoughts here this evening that are kind of premature, and I'm really not ready to share them with you, but I decided we'd do this. I decided what we do is I'll give these to you tonight, and I'll work on them some more. I'm still working on these uh, very much fluid. And then I'm going to give you a pretty close to the same sermon on a Sunday morning, maybe in about four months. Because some of this, and, and I'm telling you this ahead because you can listen and tell me what parts you didn't understand. Because we're talking about some, uh, we'll call them fundamental things, but I think at the same time some deep concepts. And it, it takes a couple times to hear it to get everything. So I think uh, there will be some questions. And I guess at the end also, if you have any questions, just share them with me. But let me know um, after the sermon, especially after church is over, what you thought was something that needed clarified more or you needed some more information about. Um, the sermon title is How Faith Lost Its Meaning. And that subtitle, if you can't see it in the back, is uh, An Examination of Pistis. Now, pistis is a Greek word. And don't worry, I'm not going to get super... That's about all in Greek we're going to talk about is that word. Uh, and so I'm not going to get into the Greek because I don't know enough to get super deep into it. And um, you don't care, probably. So anyways, in this study, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the concept of faith. And for some of you, this may be introductory. Maybe you've not heard a whole lot about the subject of faith in any context, from any religious background. Um, Hopefully this is informative to you. And for those of us that have grown up in the Church of Christ, um, I hope that this will re make you reconsider some things that I myself have uh, come to the knowledge of semi-recently. And when you're talking about faith, and somebody says they just came to the knowledge of some things about this subject, it starts to make you worry, right? But really, some things that I think that we need to reconsider, some things that I've had to reconsider in terms of how the Scriptures and what the words behind the Scriptures what meaning they have and what weight they carry and how we use this word and we throw it around sometimes and I don't think that we actually know what we're throwing around. I know I certainly didn't and I think it would be uh, very helpful for everyone here. But what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the relationship that faith has to the gospel. We're going to talk about reconsidering the meaning of faith and then the significance that the word's new meaning has on our lives and our theology, our understanding of the scripture. And then we'll have some concluding thoughts. Now, there's really a, a lot of stir going on in the religious world among the religious scholars of denominations. And this has been slowly being brought to my attention through different books that I read and some different brothers that I talk to and our shared conversations about different shared authorships and so forth. And a book that I recently read really brought this to my attention more than before is this book right here, The Gospel Allegiance by a guy named Matthew Bates. So in the religious world, sometimes I think that preachers of the Church of Christ have perhaps misrepresented the different denominations and, how they, and lumped them all together in how they view faith. Sometimes people out in the religious world, they'll lump all the different churches of Christ together. And they'll say, we all believe this or that, when there's actually different types of churches of Christ and we don't all believe this or that. Maybe we have some shared commonalities. Well... There's different types of views on grace and faith and works, and some people believe, there are large circles of people that believe that there is absolutely nothing that you do whatsoever in, in the salvation process. And those people, they're called free gracers. They believe that grace is completely free, like literally zilch you do in, um, in the salvation process. And then there's other people, and you've probably heard of Lordship Salvation. This is the common tent meeting revival um, typically, I would say probably Baptists are famous for this. Billy Graham, a famous Southern Baptist preacher, um, he went around and held huge revivals. I mean, talk, preached to thousands of people, sometimes millions in Korea at a time. Uh, just look it up on YouTube. It's really incredible how many people he preached to. Some of you older people know Billy Graham very well. And he taught lordship salvation. Accept Jesus into your heart as your Lord and Savior. And in that moment, you're saved. Well, what that has developed into in the religious world, and many um, leaders within different denominational ranks are coming to the realization, is that this has been misunderstood and misapplied. And they're growing churches, or they're really losing members of churches and developing stagnant churches where people are living immorally. What do you expect? <laughs> And now they're seeing a problem with it after about 100 years or, or less. 
And so maybe you go back to the drawing board. So that's what some scholars have been doing, some pre pre preachers and pastors. And so uh, while I'm not asking us to, to do that necessarily, I do want us to go back to some fundamentals and reconsider some of the th same things that we can learn from as well. Um, we're going to be talking about some very specific uh, vocabulary words. I'm going to be very particular about the words that I use. And sometimes we get into debates about, let's just talk about uh, resurrection for a minute. I know recently this has been a subject of discussion because Kevin Presley preached on the resurrection at his meeting in Springer Road. And my dad just preached on the bodily resurrection recently. And on that debate particularly, the words that you use are very important. The very specific words that you use. And if you don't think that words are important, down to very individual words, just remember that in Matthew chapter 22, verses 41 through 46, I think it was, Jesus made an entire argument on two words. Well, one word, Lord, used twice in the Psalms. And he hinged an entire argument based off of a single word. And uh, he left his audience speechless. And Jesus says in Matthew 12, verse 37, For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. And so the very words that we use are very influential and very important. Now, let's uh, talk about, to begin with, let's talk about faith's relationship to the gospel. How we preach the gospel, what the gospel is, and how we convey that to people. Now, before, I've given you a definition of the gospel. And I want you to think about this for just a minute. So, pin down and just think about, in your head, without blurting it out, what is the gospel? Think about it. Wheels turning. And if somebody asked you, Annette, can you give me a definition of the gospel? Could you do that? So you're thinking in your head, what is the gospel? And if you're like me, uh, a couple years ago, I was reading a book and I, I had to ask myself that question. And I felt foolish and pitiful because I could not give. I, did, what, I really didn't know what to say, you know, and we've become so familiar with that term and we use it so much. And somebody reads Romans 1 16 and says, don't be ashamed of the gospel. And they think they've really preached something. And then people are like, OK, I know I'm not supposed to be ashamed of it, but I'm not really sure exactly what I'm not supposed to be ashamed of. And that's kind of how we talk about it sometimes. And I feel like I've done a disservice to people in the past by not really giving them a good definition of the gospel. As time goes. I tinker with what I would give to somebody as the definition of the gospel. Here's what I'm working with today. <laughs> and this is based off scripture. Um, reading these passages, that we're going we're to read a couple of them real quick. Let's just do that out, out, out of the gate. Let's read Mark chapter 1 and verse 14 before I give you this definition. I mean, you can obviously see it. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So in that one, preach the gospel. He was preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. There's something in relationship between the kingdom of God and the gospel. Repent and believe in the gospel, he says. Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Let's turn over there. Romans 1, verses 1 through 5. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his Son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. There is a lot in that. <laughs> we could probably preach three sermons just on key phrases from that verse alone. And if that doesn't tell you why this is def difficult to arrange into a one sentence definition, well, there you go. Um, but those two passages being very important, I think good passages to hone in what is the gospel exactly. A couple more listed there you could read. 1 Corinthians 15 is probably the most famous account that was read to define it. But the gospel is the good news that Jesus the Christ came in the flesh, died on the cross, was buried, resurrected, and ascended into heaven to rule with all authority at the right hand of God, effectively destroying the power of sin for all that would give allegiance to him. Now that's the definition that I would give to somebody. Problem is I, I gotta, I'm working on memorizing that. <laughs> 
I don't have it quite memorized quite yet. I'm going to write it in my Bible, work on memorizing that. So if somebody asks me, what is the gospel? I'll be able to give that word for word to them. And I think that you would do well to study these verses, think about that definition, and ask yourself, what would I take away from that, or what would I add to it that's lacking? And from what I can come up with, that's, with given anything less than that would be too little. It really wouldn't be comprehensive enough. And adding anything more to it, well, it'd take two or three sentences, perhaps. So I think that's about as short as I can make it and about as comprehensive at the same time. Now, what happens, like I said before, people read Romans chapter 1. We're already there. Let's read it. Verses 16 to 17. This is a famous, famous passage. And it says there, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And that passage, if you really look at it and you pay attention to it, it's not really saying so much what the gospel is. It hints a little bit at what it is, but it's really more saying what effect that the gospel has on people. It's powerful and how people respond to it. They respond to the gospel by faith. And um, really a lot of people say that faith, well, it's not up there anymore, that word. They'll say the word faith, uh, have faith in Jesus and you will be saved. That's the gospel. That's maybe what you thought in your head before. Is that what you thought? Yeah, maybe. Somebody might say, have faith, or, or I'm sorry, be baptized in the Jesus blood and you'll be saved. That's the gospel. Is that what you thought? Well, both of those statements have truth in them, but that's really, you're, you're coming up with a, what you should respond to the gospel with. You should respond to the gospel with faith and with baptism is really what you're saying. But the gospel, the message of it, that you are to respond to, I would say, are, are these words on this page with these coming from these verses and others as well. Now, um, let's go on to the next part. I think we've, we've talked about the relationship of faith to the gospel. Faith is really the response to the gospel. It's not the gospel proper. So now we got that under our wing. Let's go on to the next point, which was reconsidering the meaning of faith uh, all together. And again, we talked about how sometimes we use this phrase, but maybe we don't know exactly what we're saying. So I think how this comes about, I had to think of a good illustration, and I don't know this is a great illustration, but it's the one I've settled on for now. My dad, when I was about 18 years old, he, well, up to that point, he tried to get me to read and tried to get me to love reading as much as he did. My mom, too. When we were homeschooled, she, she had us read, and she made us read these books that were just for the pits. Like Robinson Crusoe is one of the worst books I ever read. Never going to read that book again. And uh, anyway, he gave me this book at 18 years old, and it was called, well, I'm not going to tell you what it is. I'll tell you in just a minute. And uh, it's about yay big. And, and I thought, you know what? The book, what, was it, what it was called, and when I perused it, I thought, this is, I know this stuff, and I'm, I'm, why do I need this book? And I put it on my shelf. And it rested on my shelf where the ch shelves changed. I went to college and all that. And it continued to collect dust. And I didn't pick it up for like four years. Well, then eventually I started leading Bible studies with some members at church, with some friends of mine out at school and wherever. And finally, I come to the realization that I, I felt comfortable enough knowing what the message of the Bible was. But I needed better to hone in how to teach that to somebody. And so as I'm scouring my bookshelf, I come across this book with the inch of dust on it that my dad had given me at 18, and I pull it off the shelf, and as I'm going through that the second time, it's a gold mine, man. And it, that book is the same book I give to people all the time now whenever they haven't read their Bible, and it's called Thomas Nelson's Book of Bible Maps and Charts. A lot of you guys have it because I've given it to you or told you about it. Uh, but it took me, what, what the problem was is I was too familiar with what I, I thought I was too familiar with the Bible and its message and what it contained and all that. And because I had been around it my whole life, I didn't realize how much of it I really didn't know. And I hadn't really studied for myself because I was too close to the, to the book and the whole message. And sometimes we get too close to terms that we use like justification, salvation, and faith, and obedience, and all these different terms Christ, the title for the Messiah. And we don't really understand what they mean. And sometimes we've got to go back to the basics. And when we do, man, we find out. Maybe we didn't know this. And especially when you've got to teach it to somebody, you realize, man, 
I'm glad I studied this again. I learned a few things. The teachers here at this pulpit could tell you that uh, I can, I'm sure every one of them, Josh and Nathan and Trevor and John and Danny and all of us can testify that when we have to teach something and we have to study things to convey them to others, we are learning the most and we are learning this message every time. Well, the same is true of the word faith. And so I would put forth to you that this word has been used so much and we throw it around and we will borrow the definition used by people around us. We just all use the same definition. When you go back to what does it actually mean, perhaps we learn something. So let's do that. So here is, I only have like three slides. Here's the second slide. And this is the Greek word pistis. Um, that's what it looks like in the Greek. And it has here, actually right here on the communion table, I have Bauer, Danker, Art, and Gingrich, a Greek New Testament lexicon. And I put it out for you because I don't reckon most of y'all are going to come up here after church and look at it. But what I wanted to do is put it forth to you to let you know that this is what, uh, where I got my definition from. And I'm just quoting to you directly from the dictionary, okay? Um, so I'm trying to be transparent here. If there's anybody that you hear anything that I say and it doesn't sound right, please come let me know. Because again, I'm still working on some of this stuff. So please help me out here. But I'm trying to be transparent with you. These are the definitions. The first definition it gives for this word, which we commonly translate it as faith. It's translated that more times than it's not in the scriptures. Number one, that which evokes trust and faith, or faithfulness, reliability, fidelity, commitment. Now that's not the definition that we typically think of when we think of the word, and that most people in the religious world think of. In fact, that's never the definition that people in the religious world think of. But that's the first one given. Uh, number two, a state of believing on the basis of the reliability of one trusted, a.k.a. trust, confidence, or faith. Now, that is the one that people typically think of when they think of this word in the Bible. And that's how it's commonly translated. And then thirdly, that which is believed, a body of faith, belief, or teaching. So let's go through each one of these, and I'll give you an example from the Scriptures. Read with me. I don't have these on the board. I, have, I don't even have the verses on there. Uh, yeah, I do. On this slide right here. So there's the verse references, but turn with me to these passages. We're going to read a couple uh, from each category, but we're going to read all four from the first category because I think this is the one we need to convey the most. That's the idea that this word, when it comes up in the Scriptures, a lot of times it's almost always translated faith. But again, we're so familiar with that word, and we have misconceptualized the word that probably in a lot of places it would be better to understand and translate the phrase as faithfulness or allegiance or loyalty. In Matthew chapter 23 and verse 23, let's turn to this one real quick. We're going to back up a little bit in our Bibles. Matthew chapter 23, 23, this is the sermon of woes that, God, or that Jesus offers to the scribes and Pharisees. This word pistis is used again, and it's translated faith in the New King James Version. Uh, Danny, will you read that, verse 23? Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you pay the tithe of men and the knives and coming and have, ne and, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Okay, so he says you've neglected justice and mercy and pistis, or faith. Now, there's a couple of things in the context which indicate that probably be how we typically conceptualize the word faith is probably not the best way to render this if we want to get the full meaning across in our 21st century English, okay? If you think about justice and mercy, those are both concepts that you have to have outward, active demonstration in order to, for them to be real, right? To show justice, you have to do something to demonstrate it. To show mercy, you have to demonstrate it somehow actively and outwardly by an action. It, it's lined right up next to pistis, Faith or faithfulness, something that you have to demonstrate, right? He even says, you ought to have, these you ought to have done, that's activity, without leaving the others undone, okay? So that indicates that this is probably better translated faithfulness because when we typically think of the word faith, we think of simply sitting on a couch, willing something to happen, right? Like putting your mental trust in Jesus, putting your mental trust in the Cowboys, the Dallas Cowboys, or whatever team you want to watch, you know? That's how we typically think of it. But the word faithfulness or loyalty here indicates more than just sitting on the couch knowing I need to get groceries. It's getting up and going and getting the groceries. It's putting your mind to work uh, with your body. You get the idea? 
2 Thessalonians chapter 1, turn with me over there, verse 4. And I'll actually back up to verse 3. I'll read this one because I'm, I'm flying off the hip on this one a little bit as far as how, what verses I exactly want to read. I'm reading from the New King James here. We're bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly, and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other, so that we, so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and pistis, faith, in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Now, in that context, he understands that their faith, their pistis, endures because of how they are responding in tribulation and persecution. Because of the context there, it would best seem that the word faithfulness would be a good rendering there for the word, that your faithfulness in all your persecutions and tribulations is manifested by your endurance. I would put forth to you. Think about that. That seems to be the case when you keep on reading in verse 8. He continues, same sentence, unbroken sentence, talking about Christ is in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is coming back to take vengeance on those who do not obey, but before he commended them for their pistis, for their faithfulness, their trust in God, their loyalty to him, which incorporates some type of outward bodily action, obedience. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 5, the next verse. And there are other verses. These aren't the full limit of verses for this definition. These are just the first four that we might put forth to demonstrate that this word can properly and should properly be understood as faithfulness or loyalty. For though I be absent in the flesh, and am I with you in spirit, joining and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk ye in him. And so the connection between seeing their good order, their orderliness, in connection to their pistis, their faith, indicates to me that this is really better understood as faithfulness. Because he saw their orderliness, their good conduct, and he called it faith, it's understood he's talking about their faithfulness to Christ. And so that seems to be the best understanding. Verse 6 says they receive Christ. That's something you do. They continue to walk in him, they, he says. That's the idea of loyalty to Christ by your continued obedience toward him, continued submission toward him. So, all of that I put forth to you as examples of this first definition that we typically don't use it that way. We typically don't think of the word that way when we use the word faith. So hopefully that made sense to you. Um, and we could give more definitions if we need to in the future. Now the next example, or next definition is the idea of mental exercise, mental assent, uh, exercising your mind to think on something and to put trust in it and confidence. And we see an example of that. I'm just going to read these off to you because we are familiar with this. This is how we typically use it. Mark 11, verse 22. So Jesus answered and said to them, have faith, have pistis in God. That's not have faithfulness to God, have in God. No, he's saying put your trust mentally in God. Romans 3 verse 22 says, Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all, on who, on, to all and on all who believe, there is no difference. The idea is there is faith in Jesus Christ, trusting in Him. Okay, that's the second definition. And so there's many places that's used, and sometimes that's the proper definition of the word. The third way that it's used is to talk about a body of doctrine. In Jude verse 3, we typically... Uh, we understand this generally when it comes across in our English translations. Jude verse 3 says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith. Pistis. In our English translations, typically the article the is put in front of it to indicate this is an objective body of teaching. It's talking about the doctrine of Christ. You're putting your faith in his doctrine, in the faith. And um, this was once delivered to all the saints, he says. Another example is Romans chapter 1 and verse 5. And um, we can give definitions for the rest of these as well. Now I want to quote here real quick something from Matthew Bates. I thought this was very helpful in understanding why the evolution of this word and the confusion over it. He said, English translations of the Bible have always favored the words faith and believe from John Wycliffe's 1300s translation and the King James 1611 version onward. English speakers have powerful emotional attachments to these words. Even when we suspect them of being inadequate, 
We may nonetheless feel that the words faith and believe are unimpeachable, meaning they can't be done away with and replaced, as if they were given to us by Jesus and the apostles themselves to explain what we need to do to be saved. If that make, makes sense, what he's saying is, we act like the English translation was inspired. And that's the original. We always need to understand that we're not reading an original. We're reading a translation of copies of the original text of the scriptures. The Bible was originally written in Greek. And throughout time, English translators have tried to identify what's the best word to translate this Greek word into English. Like he said, we've become so attached to this word, I put forth to you because of the way that lordship, salvation, and free grace has been taught for about over 100 years, in America at least, that we think there is no other word to represent pistis. And therefore we miss entire definitions and primary definitions that this can and should properly be understood in many cases as faithfulness, which changes the game. How you understand salvation and how you respond to the gospel. If it's faithfulness rather than just simply sitting on your couch willing something to the Lord, then that will manifest itself very differently in your life. And it will affect the way your church looks. People just living however they want to live or living faithfully to God. You see, uh, that this, this should hopefully communicate the, the significance of this word study. What I do want to leave one last thing before we get off this technical binge, <laughs> which you're probably tired of already, is I do want to say this. Um, I'm not putting forth to you that every place, hopefully I communicated this, that every place the word pistis comes up, we should translate it according to the first definition. I'm just saying it can be translated that way and should be many places. You say, how, Aaron, in the world do we know when to translate it one way and when the next? Well, there's specific verses that even scholars have difficulty on all sorts of words. And there's whole books written about it. How should we translate this word in this verse? And there's not common agreement. But many times, and this, the only thing I learned in Greek over the last eight months or however long it's been, I don't know a whole lot. I don't feel like I've been doing that great. But the one thing I have learned is how do you know when to translate a word a certain way? Context, context, context. And if you have to take a guess, just guess context. And look for those context clues like I was pointing out to you in 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 4. I said this would be probably translated faithfulness there probably because when you keep on reading, he says Christ is going to judge those who do not obey the gospel. That indicates how faith is being, that pistis is being used in that context. So the context says, to me, faithfulness there. You get the idea? So context is the clue. And this is an entire, I mean... People have dedicated their lives to how to translate a word in a passage. And we owe a lot to people. If you think that um, there's no sense in studying foreign languages, well, you would not be able to read the Bible if people had not dedicated their lives to this. So I appreciate them very much, and I'm glad that they actually know what they're doing. Okay, the next thing we're going to go on to now is a little bit more applicable. And let's talk about the significance of all this, which I've kind of touched at it, okay? I've touched at it. Let's get a little more specific. Um, we've learned that the word faith can more accurately be translated faithfulness sometimes in many places. The idea of having faith in Christ is married to the idea of being faithful to Christ. And the very significant consequential aspect of all this is how we think and how we live. Now, I recently taught on Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. Turn back over there with me. And I want to make a point that I made in that lesson I gave recently called the renewing of the Christian mind. I'm not telling you anything here you haven't already heard in the last couple of months. We're going to read these passages and I'll make that common point. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you may prove that you are good and acceptable and perfect, Lord God. Okay. This passage, the key words that I want you to hone in on, he says, present your bodies a living sacrifice. This is how to become sanctified to God. This is how to offer yourself as an offering to God. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, 
In verse 2, he says, by the renewing of your mind. Now, the point that we learned recently is that you cannot offer yourself as a sacrifice to God with just your mind. You can't just dedicate your mind to God and think, I really feel good about myself because most people don't even do that. He says, take your mind and what you put in your mind, what you feed your mind will have a direct impact on how your body responds. And what you do with your body will in turn also have an effect on your mind. It's an interchangeable relationship. They can't be separated. And people think that they can consume all sorts of filth and it's not going to affect their body, but it will. And if you've got addictions, I test you to to, to write down what all the filth you're consuming on a daily basis. There is an inseparability factor to this. And some people think they can compartmentalize their Christianity and they can dedicate three-fourths of their life to God, but this part over here that involves their body and or their mind will just keep separate. No, it doesn't work that way. The idea of pistis, faithfulness, loyalty, allegiance to Christ is that you give your full self to Him. There's nothing held back. That's why many people came to Jesus wanting to follow him, and he said, no, you can't. Not until you get with the program. It requires full consecration, full dedication of your body and your mind, okay? So this is the idea. And this is evidenced in a surplus of passages when we look at different uh, places where Christ or the apostles beckon us to obey the will of God. He says, obey the will of God in John chapter 3 and verse 36 in the New American Standard Bible. In John chapter 12 and verse 42, the, the, the scribes, many of them believe Jesus, it says, but they were not willing to confess because of their rank in the temple. So they had the mental aspect down, but they weren't willing to go through with the bodily aspect of it because they liked their reputation too much in their position. Um, there's passages we talk about we have to do something. In Acts chapter 22, verse 16, the response to the gospel to Saul from Ananias was arise. You can't just keep laying there on the floor for three days praying. Okay, you did that. Great. But you got to arise and wash away your sins. That's a bodily response to this mental activity. Uh, and then there's work that has to be done. In Acts chapter 26 and verse 20, I think it was King Agrippa that Paul was talking to when he says you've got to repent and do works befitting repentance. That means change your mind. And there will be a bodily response to it. And all of that is the concept of pistis, faithfulness to God. You're, you're showing allegiance. You're giving your loyalty to Christ in that moment. That's what Saul was doing when Ananias called him. He was offering himself in full loyalty and faithfulness to Christ. Even if it meant losing his uh, vocation, his status within Pharisaical realms and all such as that. And then there's this other aspect that I want to show you a couple of passages where Scripture shows us that we are going to be judged according to the things that we do in this body. And this is very important. This is very helpful to understand when you're talking to people about faith and understanding exactly what we're talking about when we mean have faith in Jesus Christ, okay? Uh, Matthew chapter 20, 16, sorry, verse 27 says, For the Son of Man will come in the glory of His Father with His angels, and then He will reward each according to His works. On the day of judgment, remember I always talk about and describe it as this huge movie screen, and all of your works are going to come across that movie screen, and they're going to have at least some role in the judgment from God. Another one, John 5, verse 28, says the same thing. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear His voice, Christ's voice, and come forth those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Doesn't matter if you're a Christian or you're not. When you come out of that grave, if you've not been faithful to Christ, and all that evil comes across the movie screen as I think about it, and you did not repent and give loyalty, give pistis to Christ, then you're going to be judged and go to hell. That's what the script, and I'm just giving you a couple. 2 Timothy 4, verse 14. Revelation 20, verse 12. The books were opened and people were judged according to their works. There's so many passages. And people act like sometimes that what you do has no bearing on your salvation. And I mean, I just can't avoid it. There is obviously some bearing, at least, that 
your human bodily activity has on your salvation. And so people that will preach and indicate that grace is completely free, there is no human response required, they would do good to, to listen. I think Ron Corder was the one that told me, grace is a free gift that will only cost you your entire life. <laughs> And that's really the truth. The free grace idea is just completely erroneous. Now, with this, I do want to offer a disclaimer, okay? Because some people take this. And I just re listened to a video recently. Ed told me to watch this video. This, it, was, uh, it was funny, more or less. Uh, this preacher was giving a whole 45-minute exposition on the Church of Christ and how the Church of Christ was a cult. And uh, in that, he said he used a lot of examples of Church of Christ members he had come across and had conversations with, and some of them were just straight up obnoxious. I listened to the examples he described, and I could think of a few people, just like he described, who were Church of Christ members, and they were obnoxious, and I would say the same things about them that he did. <laughs> I would agree. There wasn't anything I was disagreeing with for most of it, because you do. You get people in any movement, in any kingdom of men or God, and you're going to have some people that are just straight up obnoxious, and they give the whole body of Christians a bad name. And unfortunately, some people's only encounter will be with that person. And maybe it's me. And that's why we should be so conscious about how we are communing, communicating ourselves to other people and presenting ourselves and the impression that we leave with. You only get one impression. I found this out recently. You only get one impression. I mean, I learned this a long time ago, but it, you know, just recently it it manifests it again. You only get one impression with people, and it's really hard to change that. Well, anyways, what I'm not saying is I'm not saying that you can do enough good works and qualify for heaven that way, okay? Now, I've heard some brethren teach sometimes, sporadically, basically that. And I've heard a brother say before that you are justified um, by your works, and they didn't mean it in the James 2 sense. Where James says, um, faith without works is dead. <laughs> and sometimes you hear that. And maybe somebody hears a Church of Christ member teach that you can do enough good works that you'll be saved and go to heaven. And that's unfortunate. Because that is false doctrine. I don't care what church you go to. I don't care if you did take the communion. <laughs> okay, I'm not saying that you can work as hard as you can in this life and God's grace just fills in the cracks where your works weren't enough. <laughs> sometimes people have that concept. They don't maybe say it like that, but that's what they're describing. God's grace is filling in the cracks where I just couldn't quite do enough. I'm not saying that if you keep some short list of holy commands and you stay away from other, some other short list of big sins, that you'll be justified on the day of judgment. That's not what I'm saying. Because sometimes we like to create these catalogs of if we eat of the communion and we do all this other stuff and we aren't super bad, then we'll be saved. That's not what I'm saying. Don't misunderstand me. Some people preach that. That's not what I'm saying. And I'm not saying there's only that there is some saving power in the very act of taking the communion. Or that there's some saving power in the water of baptism. Now that's, that's a lot of times what people say that we preach. And maybe some people do preach that. Maybe some Church of Christ preachers do preach that. And members. But that's, I want you to know that is not what I'm saying. That water, you can dip in it seven times like Naaman. And it ain't going to save you. If you ain't doing it for the right reason, if you're not doing it as an act of faithfulness to Jesus Christ, your Savior, who is now your King. If you're not doing it for that reason, for the remission of sin, then it ain't gonna, there's nothing in the water. That's pretty dirty water, probably. It's not filtered. So I, I want you to understand, when you come to church on Sunday morning and you sit down and you think and you've been living however you want to live... And maybe you just commit half of yourself to Jesus and you come down and you take this cup and you take this bread and you think that that's going to save you. You might as well be a Catholic because that's what Catholics think. They think that there is sacramental power in the loaf when the priest puts that bread in their mouth. You can go to hell. That's not faith. That's thinking that you're saved by your works. That's what that is. And so all these explanations miss the mark and place the focus of justification on the works themselves. And so what we do want to communicate, at least what I want to communicate, is that faith in Christ cannot be divorced from faithfulness to Christ. And faithfulness to Christ 
cannot be realized or expressed without humble works of faith. And if you think that it can, then you've missed everything that we talked about from Scripture. These works of faith, or the, I like to call them expressions of faith. I, again, because words matter, and sometimes the word work itself, when you use that word, you might as well forget having a conversation with somebody. As soon as you say it, people already have a conception that pops in their mind, and they will not let go of the fact that you're teaching works, right, uh, works righteousness. If you use that word. And so I, I prefer the word expressions of faith because it captures the idea of pistis, that you do have a bodily response for your mental um, allegiance to Christ. And whatever you, however you preach it, these expressions of faith need to be placing emphasis on Christ, who is your king, who deserves your entire mind and body simply because of who he is and what he has done. And that's why... We do what we do because he deserves it just because of who he is and what he's done. Now, how did all this come about? And then we're going to end. I'm doing better than I thought. Like I said, I didn't really know what to expect from this. When I said I'm doing better than I thought, I was talking about time. I have no clue if y'all are capturing anything that I'm saying. Okay. How did all this come about? How did all this morphing of words and confusion and the debacle about faith come to what it is. I wrote these down kind of hurriedly. I'd really like to put more time into this. So this isn't necessarily a full list or even maybe a completely accurate one. So take it with a grain of salt. But I, here's some theories and ideas. All this has come about because of a rattle, radical overreaction against heresies of Catholicism. Another reason is a few hundred years on top of that, for those reactions, a few hundred years of words evolving and losing their full sense and meaning to people in a second language, English. The English language has changed a lot since the translation 1611 by William Tyndale. Well, that wasn't William Tyndale. That was the King James Version. And words and the understanding the people had of those words in 1611 is not necessarily the meaning we understand of those words in 2021. Because language changed. I got a whole book. It's called Words of Obsolete English. A whole book of words that are no longer have the meaning that we use them for in the English language. I just got the book because I thought it was interesting. Uh, another one is whenever you give, on top of all this, 400 years from the reformers of the Catholic Church, there's a loss of context due to time, distance, and culture for the explanations of faith that they gave. And there are many people that claim Martin Luther as their father of their theology, but Martin Luther... <laughs> wouldn't preach what they're preaching <laughs> and they're like i mean i don't agree with martin luther but he didn't agree with them either <laughs> and a lot of people claim that these great preachers of faith from the reformation movement are their daddies and granddaddies but they wouldn't be uh endorsing what some people are preaching today and claiming they believe and taught then you add sincere i i really want to emphasize this one you know sometimes we disparage people who teach false doctrine as if they're all balaam's out there just a prophet for profit well, some people, they, they sincerely have a desire and an effort for large-scale revival in America. Billy Sunday, I believe, was one of those people. I believe he was sincere. But Billy Sunday led a lot of people down the wrong path. He taught this lordship salvation stuff. Just accept Jesus into your heart. They have a moment's salvation experience. They go on their way. Nothing changed. They don't have allegiance to Christ. Nothing changed. Hundreds of thousands of people came to these tent revivals out of sincere efforts and I think even as that goes today, you have market-driven churches who they, they think the success of preaching the gospel, whatever they call the gospel, is large numbers in buildings. And if you think that because that number on that sign right there is getting higher and higher each Sunday, that we are a successful church, or the gospel is being preached here, that's absolutely no indication of the gospel being preached here. That number could go down to 20 and has no bearing as to the actual effects of if the gospel is being preached here or not. Okay, That's how people... I think today in the market driven church movement you had another 50 years of people living out faith in Christ as they define it improperly and uh, we get too familiar you see with the word when really we're not familiar with it at all and so all this said I want to read Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 through 9 turn with me over there while you're reading what the Bible actually says <laughs> well okay what the Bible actually says what you when you, while you're reading what the New King James Version or whatever translation you're using says, because you're not actually reading the Greek, 
I'm going to read to you my translation based off of everything that we've said so far. And again, I'm not sure this, I might change my mind about this. Somebody might uh, show me, I'm still working on Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. This is a difficult passage. But uh, I think this is, ex expresses best in 20, 2021 English what this is saying. For by grace, verse 8 of Ephesians 2, for by grace you have been saved through faithfulness and that not of your own doing, it is the gift of God, not of works of merit, lest anyone should boast. And from here on is the New King James Version. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Interestingly enough, most people don't read verse 10 when they're reading this famous passage. We were created for good works. And that is expressed properly when you understand it as faithfulness as opposed to some meritorious deed that you do and then you go to the temple to pray and over here is a tax collector but you look up to heaven and you say I did all I was supposed to do <laughs> like the Pharisee in that Lucan parable so all that together I'll leave you um, in about two minutes we'll be done with a list of things I'd like you to consider from all this review and a little bit of takeaway I want you to think that words matter and sometimes people say this is just semantics well, think about what's actually being said, and sometimes semantics matter. I guess that's the message. <laughs> what they mean is, oh, let's just not quibble over a few words. Well, Jesus quibbled over a few words sometimes, and sometimes word, a few words do matter. How we say things that, and, and what we mean can make or break the teaching of God's truth due to its, the corruption of language over years. Uh, here's another one. We only perpetuate the misunderstanding of the Greek word pistis when we use the word faith to express the biblical concept of faithfulness. And so I'm going to try to do better. When I talk about being saved by faith, I'm going to try to make a deliberate commitment to say we are saved by faithfulness to Jesus Christ. And that slight tweak should make people pause and ask you, why did you say it that way? Or at least in their mind, they should get the point that you, you mean something different than what they mean. We need to be very, or we need rather to verify, and especially as teachers that get up here in this pulpit, we need to verify that we understand what the gospel is. I was just ashamed of myself being a teacher for all the years I have, and I could not give a basic explanation of the gospel. And the explanation I get, did give was a response to the gospel. It wasn't the gospel. And I just felt ashamed of myself. I'm just being honest with you. Um, and so we as teachers need to be, uh, understand what the gospel is and that we're communicating the gospel properly to the church and to the world. That's very important. <laughs> Even if you're just a member. Okay, we need to always be diligent in searching the scriptures daily to verify that what we've been taught all our lives is the truth. Um, that goes for anybody. I am not one who's going to get up here. I'm not for <coughs> hiding certain things because people just can't understand it. Well, if they can't understand it, just be transparent and show it to them. And maybe they don't understand it, but don't hide it because... When they find out that you're hiding things, that just destroys your reputation, if anything. Besides that, you're jeopardizing that person's soul because you don't know everything. So we need to be a people like the Bereans, diligent in searching the scriptures daily to verify that what we've been taught our whole lives is the truth, that we're not too familiar with it, that we are actually unfamiliar with it. I have three more things here. If we misunderstand works and how they fit in the process of justification, we need to understand it. Well, if you find out that you did misunderstand works and how they fit in the process of justification, we need to understand it and we need to start correcting each other when we hear the Scripture misrepresented. Uh, I think that would do good in a friendly, brotherly way. Now, while we do have a responsibility in being saved, we need to emphasize the work of Christ on the part of our justification and sanctification so much that no one can mistake us for preaching justification by works of merit. And I'll just be... Transparent again. I feel like I have not emphasized the language of Christ and his work and role in our salvation in my preaching as much as I should. I think back in time and I think, did I preach anything wrong? No, I don't think I did. It's just that, see, Paul, when he preached and he gave the Roman message of the gospel, he, he, had, he preached that Christ was the one that accomplished our salvation so much that in chapter 3 and verse 1... He responds to what's probably going to come up when people read this letter. And he says, well, uh, then should we just keep on saying that grace should abound? People might come up with that 
response and that thought might creep in their mind when they hear Paul preach that God's grace is what saves and that the work of Christ is what saves. And then he has to correct that and say, no, that's not what I'm saying. God's grace is important. Faith is important. Faithfulness is important. And when you put it all together, still the credit should go to Christ. So much so that nobody can mistake us for preaching justification by works of merit. And then finally, I'll say, we need to live completely consecrated Christ in both mind and body. We need to live by faithfulness to Christ's rule in our lives in every way. And if that doesn't define your life, then you either never understood the gospel or you just took your eyes off the cross. One of the two. And you need to get your eyes back on the cross tonight by dedicating your full mind, body, and strength to Christ. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords, and He will judge you according to your works. And I just heard, that I read this the other day in Muscle on a Shovel. I've been reading, reading this book. Randall t- tells Michael, he says, there's two things that you can be sure of, taxes and death. Now, you've heard that. But he reminded me of something. You know, I know of people who have gotten out of taxes, but I don't know of anybody who got out of death. And that made me stop. And I thought about that again, especially with recent deaths. And I just think that's a good conversation piece. I don't know of anybody that's ever gotten out of death. And you will stand before the King of Kings one day, and he is going to open up the books. And you are not going to be able to just throw the word grace out there and get a get out of jail free card. So if you're somebody that needs to obey the gospel, or you're somebody that needs to respond to the gospel in repentance and do works befitting repentance, then come forward while we stand and sing.